Brill, the legendary Eddie Brill. Uh, it is an honor to have you here with us it today, is. sir. It nice really is. Very kind of you, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Of course, many years was the guy, the guy for, oh. on Letterman. <laughs> <clears throat> um, how did can we ask how did you get that gig? Well, like you know, any gig in the industry, it's who you know. And uh, I was working at the Dana Carvey show, warming up the crowds there. Uh, Louis oh. C.K. was working there as one of the directors, producers. Bob oh, wow. Smigel as well. Uh, you know, the the actors were great. It was Dana Carvey and Stephen Colbert and Steve Carell, and on and on yeah. and on. Well, Louis, you know, when the show got um, you know canceled. Louis went to work for Letterman, and in the course of the time there, Letterman needed a new warm-up comic, and he asked Louis, and Louis recommended me. So, wow, cool. I, you know, I had done a little bit of warm-up before, like I said, Dana Carvey. Um, I warmed up Saved by the Bell for a short time in L.A. <laughs> That's actually on my list of questions. Yeah, <laughs> That's the, the pinnacle of the career right there, man. Yeah, wow. it was it was fun. The most fun about that job was it was literally five feet across the hall from The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. <clears throat> Oh, cool. So I got to see all the action, which was great. Um, and then, you know, I got recommended for that show. So, you know, I had like a six-week trial period that turned into 17 years. Wow, very nice. The, yeah, it you, was awesome. And you know, let me let me backtrack a little bit. You know, talking about warm-up, I mean, is that it? – because I've, um, I've had the, the honor of working with Joey Cola. Yeah. Who, who by the way – Joey Cola, whenever you say his name, people just light up. People just, yeah. that's the nicest guy in the world. Oh, yeah. I love Joey. And I have to tell you, when when we were spreading the word yesterday that you were coming on, we had a very similar uh, reaction. Lots of people reaching out. Oh, very my God, good. Eddie is the best. This is great. Oh, congratulations. Uh, Mark David Hirschman. You know what's interesting about Joey is that he looked more like my father than I do. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> he really does. My father was, like, really short and... Very, you know, like a high wire act, you know, and a lovely man that made people laugh, you know. So I always tell Joey, I said, he's the real son, you know, <laughs> um, and I, your, your parents are wondering where I am. You know? <laughs> it's like that Lily Tomlin, uh, <clears throat> Bette Midler movie from the late oh, 80s. Oh, yes, yeah. <laughs> it's That's like DeVito good. and Schwarzenegger. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so it was a very similar reaction, and, uh, and Mark David Hirschman begged me to, to say hello to you. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, he's a very good guy. No, nah, that's a very politically correct answer. You well, have no you know, idea who I'm talking about. He's good side, so you know, <laughs> I, I've yet to see the side you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's a prick. Um, yeah. No, I'm kidding. Um, so, so, yeah, so what? So I've seen Joey in action doing the warm-up for, for Rachel Ray, and we've had a lot of discussions about it. It's, it's, not, it's not an easy thing. I mean, it's, it, and it's more than just going in there and doing your act. It's, you're not doing your act, kind right. of, you know. Your, your job is to keep the audience together. And there's all different kinds of warm-ups. You know, Joey used to work at the Rosie Show as the warm-up. Right. And there was something that happened to Joey at Long Island Railroad uh, in Penn Station where somebody pushed him down the stairs and he had busted up his ankles. Oh, wow. And I got to warm up Rosie for like a week. And uh, it was completely different than Letterman, you know, the right. whole setup. It's uh, you're constantly running up and down the aisles and you're just trying to keep this crowd together. And it's, you know, it's early in the day. Uh, I also warmed up a show out in Silver Cup in Long Island, the uh, Madigan Men, uh, which was uh, a great show, uh, an Irish show yeah. brilliant gabriel byrne was the star yeah oh. and that's completely different that you're doing like eight to ten hour days and the crowd is exhausted and you just got to keep them informed and awake right. and up and joey's perfect for that um me I'm, I'm a little you know with letterman it was a different deal because we had an 18 minute warm-up and it was the reason why we had this certain time is because it worked for johnny carson's crowds so Johnny Carson's producers gave Dave the setup that they used for Johnny. Um, you know, at four o'clock the, the doors open, at four twelve the warm up starts, at four thirty, boom, the show starts taping and without fail, like a well oiled machine. Um, I didn't have to run in between commercial breaks because Paul Schaefer and the band was always performing right. there. So, you know, I had different responsibilities in the commercial breaks, you know, talking to Dave and talking about what the next segment is or whatever, you know, those kind of things, or just talking about the Beatles or, you know, whatever it was. Yeah. So each different show that I had done, like I had warmed up a This Is Your Life show. I warmed up a couple of game shows. Um, it's usually, it's a very important job. 
somebody has to do it. You have to keep the crowd going. Like say you're doing Madigan Men at the beginning, of, you're doing a scene and there's like, this guy is breaking up with a girl. Now you take this really long break until they reshoot. The, and now you have to tell the audience, remember in the last section, this guy was breaking up with a girl. Right. And right. Like, oh yeah. And then, you know, you just, because you're there, the audience is just like barely keeping barely alive. And you're almost like, you know, begging them to stay, you know, offering them bribes, you know, here's a t-shirt, please <laughs> yeah. keep laughing. So it's a very important job. It's a job at every single show that has a studio audience. And uh, and there's not that many, but it's uh, it's a pretty cool job to have. Letterman's job was really cool. You would, I would think doing Letterman was, and I'm not trying to say any of them are, are easy, but I would think Letterman was probably the easiest because... You, like you said, the you know a studio audience trying to follow Madigan men. You know, there's a plot to follow, and there's a more involved. Where Letterman, it's energetic. You got a, a great band playing. You got all these famous, super famous, super celebrities, movie stars coming on as guests. I would think the crowd are, is already pumped, and you're just keeping them there. It, it, but you'd be surprised; it wasn't consistent. Like the, really, you know, people are are tourists mostly. The audience weren't New Yorkers, right? You know, a lot of people say, well, it's the New York audience. No, 1%, if barely 1% of the audience. Uh, yeah, I didn't think Yorkers. of that. Okay. You know, yeah. it's all tourists. They're, it's like an e-ticket from Disney World where, you're, okay, now I'm going to do the Letterman ride. Now I'm going to do the Times Square ride. And, you know, so people would come in. They might be drunk because they're partying, they're traveling, and right. they're running around, and they're shopping, and they have their bags with them, and it's hot outside, and they come in, and it's cool. So, you know, there are some audiences that you had to really work. And... uh you just learn to, as a comedian, you learn how to sort of test the rhythm of the room. Right. And you could right. sense when they're going down, and you, you know, you just change the energy. It's like, say, as a comedian, if I'm following someone really high energy, like a sort of like a heavy metalish kind of comic. Right. Uh, you know, my job isn't to do that same kind of energy. My job is to like take a beat and a pause and a confident look, like, okay, it's going to be a little different, and I got this under control. And the audience psychologically knows that you're in control and you're their buddy. Right. I'll give you another example. Like say you go to a party and there's some guy's house and the guy meets you at the door and he takes your coat and he puts it on the bed and he tells you we're going to have food and we're going to have drinks and we're going to play Twister. And, you know, that's who you are. You're the guy at the door. Right. right. Letting everyone know you're, you know, this is your party and you're welcome to it. Right. Yeah. Now what about, but, but saved by the bell. I mean, you know, yeah. you you look at Andy and I, and obviously we are everything Taylor Swift. You look at us, you think Taylor right. Swift. Now, I would think yeah. for you, it's the same thing with Saved by the Bell, right? You were just the perfect fit. I for was that. babysitting, pretty much. <laughs> right. I was babysitting, and you know, it was you know junior high school kids and stuff, right. and they just wanted to see the kids who were the stars. Right. There were six of them. They were great. They were nice people. The uh, Belding, uh, you know, the principal was an amazing guy. It's still an amazing guy. Um, there, it was just a nice group to work with. And but, the, you know, they're kids, and they, they're like they're starstruck that they're going to go to this taping and see their favorite. You know, uh, th these are like rock stars. Hormones are go. just going <laughs> right, and you're in their way. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, a friend of mine uh, is uh, married to the drummer for Avril Lavigne's band. Oh. Yeah. And so once we went to the Nassau Coliseum and uh, we, we got that section that's right up by stage. And I've never gotten so many death stares from 12 year old girls in my life. Oh, God. <laughs> then yeah, when like, I was what standing are you doing here, that right. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. They're old. Are Why you the old over people? from last night's Islander game? Right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> did you uh, did you know that working on Saved by the Bell that this, you know, the one girl would go on to get naked all over that strip tease movie? Had no idea. Was never in, you know, my, you know, the cool thing was, and I can't think of her name. She had an odd name. It's like Mavis, but it's not that. She was Belding's real life girlfriend and she was on the show Fridays. And um, she was a brilliant, I can't believe I can't remember her name because I knew her pretty well. She was in the audience. She was the one adult who would sit in the audience. And I played to her, right. you know, and, she, and yeah. I made her laugh, which was really incredible for me because, you know, you just really, as a comedian, you want laughs. You want to, you know, you want people to Reaction. have fun. And, yeah. and she and she was really incredibly great. She actually just passed away a couple of years oh. ago. Oh wow! But you know, it was I. I went to Emerson College in Boston, which was has turned out a million great comedians from back in the 
30s, 40s, 50s, all through <laughs> nowadays. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Norman Lear and, Hen- and you know Henry Winkler, and you can take <laughs> Leno, and then then it's like Dennis Leary, Stephen Wright, Mario Cantone, oh, and wow. then Lauren Dombrowski. I mean, you can, and then there's Bill Burr and Anthony Clark, and um, you know, there's just so many great uh, people that had gone through Emerson. And there was a guy who, who was working on Saved by the Bell. He called me up. I was living in L.A., making very little money. You know, you working the I was working the comedy store every night. You know, thirty, twenty-five bucks a spot or whatever. And it was a chance to make some real money. And uh, it was like once every couple of weeks or so. And uh, I took it. And it was hard work. It was really hard work. And um, I ended up getting fired from it. Oh. <laughs> well, there was this little girl who was heckling. And, you know, she's like 11. And so you heckling. smacked her. You suck! So, you know, you know, <laughs> and you can't go, well, I didn't, you can't, you know, do the typical heckle thing. Right. So I was trying to calm her down because the, and I did. I calmed her down and then she With heckled a pillow. again. And she, she kind of was ruining the day. Right. Wow. So I said something like, you know, I had a dream. I had a joke. I was going to about dreams. I said, I had a dream that, that that little girl didn't show up. Because the crowd hated her, right. hated her, and they wanted me to trash her. Right. I said, so I didn't even trash her. I said, you know, I had a dream that that little girl didn't show up today and ruin our day. And she burst out in tears. Oh, good. And then I, yeah. <laughs> Should have went with, and, uh, hey, I don't smack dicks out of your mouth when right, you're at work. Exactly. You're not going to you know, you're not gonna go there. Or, you know, you'll definitely be in the annals of history. Um, you know, he told a little girl. You know that she might be doing that now right. in her career. I kind of have a fantasy that she is. She was that terrible <laughs> of a human being. <laughs> no wonder why the kids were staring at you. At the, <laughs> the um, so it was funny. So you know the, the the they said, look, you know the parents came in and complained. I said, you know what? Let me talk to the parents, and uh, and I'll set them straight. You know, look, your daughter's a bitch, and you better get her under control now. <laughs> No, I didn't. I didn't even have that chance. And he, they said, "Look, we, get, we have to, these people are important people in the industry and right. our thing." And oh wow! I, so you know, but it was okay. I made the the money that I needed to make, and you know, it wasn't really what I wanted to do, but it set me in right. the direction to do warm up. Like I said, I did this is your life uh, show in uh, New York, and you know, I did and I did a bunch of them. You know, and it, it was really fun and. Uh, and again, it was lucrative, which was fine. It gave me the opportunity to not have to travel to make to do some shitty gig to make sure, right. a certain kind of money. I could make decent money and then stick around and work, you know, all the clubs in New York and make the shitty money there. Right. And you know, because in reality, you you just want stage time for stand up. Right. And and it allows you to be home more often too, which yeah. I'm assuming is a good thing. Um, yeah, you know, I love, you know, one of the great things for me is it's about eight, 1989, 90. I started working in Europe and, you know, it was amazing and uh, very, I learned a lot more as a comedian working in Europe and, and in the like, you know, England and Ireland, of course. And then the, there's expats in Paris or Amsterdam, you work for them. And then, you know, they're connected with people in Amsterdam and Hong Kong and cool. stuff. So I, and I, Bangladesh, I got to work, you know, you oh, get wow. to work in. And you and the one thing that I noticed that you w- would notice, and I was as guilty as any American comic, is there's so much pandering in American comedy. There's so much wanting applause instead of creating laughter. Right. Oh, like give yourselves yes. a round of applause for coming out tonight. Well, you know Absolutely. what? The truth is, is like I've gone out before. I don't need to applaud. I'm very good at it. I don't need to. You know, it's just the audience. American audience comedians mostly are trying to get the audiences cohesive by getting them to put their hands together instead of being really funny and a charming host or whatever. Right. So I, the first night I was in London, I went to audition at the comedy store and I went to the MC and I said, here's my, I didn't say, here's my intro. I go, you could tell him I've been on HBO and blah, blah, blah. And I gave this whole list and the guy looked at me like, fuck you. And I was like, what? And so I go up on stage. He doesn't say any of the things. Doesn't even say I'm from America. He bring, I'm following this phenomenal comedian named Jim Tavare, who plays a stand-up bass in his act. It's musical, the worst yeah. possible thing, the hardest possible thing to follow. Right. And he, I was kind of like, why? Uh, so I do the set, and luckily it went well, and they invited me back for the whole week. 
So I'm backstage every night with the comedians and they're sort of warming up to me, you know, and I, they told me, you know, you're the only comedian in, from America that's come over here that hangs out with us in the green room. A lot of them think America is a better country than us and thinks we're, you know, these back country people and we work just as hard as anybody else. And sure, comedy right. in England is always been, you know, Monty Python yeah. and you know, Faulty Towers and, you know, British comedy has always been amazing. And these American comics have come over and treated them like shit and not hung out with them. I said, well, I'm, you know, I'm a comic and this is what we do backstage. Right. We hang out. And I said, now we're, that we're asking questions, what was that the other night when you, I went up on stage and you just brought me up and he says, I thought, I thought you were bragging about your career. And I'm like, I don't, he didn't know that I was giving him an intro. He thought I was going up to him and telling him how great I was. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> because they don't do that or they didn't do that at that time. Right. So he was like, fuck you. I don't give a shit if you've been on these shows. And, you know, and I said, no, that's my intro. He goes, why would you do an intro? He said, people who work the comedy store are the best comics in the country, in probably the world. And you, if you're on the show, you're pretty good. And if you suck, they're going to know. Right. So, but so if you set yourself up for failure by saying how great you are and all these, and I never thought about those things. That we, no. we were just talking. We about We had a that. conversation last oh, week about yeah, this. Just about that exactly. So, like, and your next comedian, he's super funny. He's the funniest right. person you're ever going to meet. Colleges but, and clubs, you know, it's just any kind of way to trump it up instead of just saying, "Okay, ladies and gentlemen, now you know Billy Johnson," and then you go up on stage. So is and, that what uh, they were doing in places like England? Were they just saying, okay, here we go with Eddie yeah, Brill? Are you ready? You know, our next turn, they would call them turns sometimes. Oh, wow. You well, know, and here's your next turn. It's like blah, blah, blah. And you just play, you know, and you come out there and the crowd is expecting you to do well. And, you know, every one of the comics I worked with that week were amazing. They were brilliantly funny and sharp. Right. And, you know, so I learned a lot about not care, not trying to, you know, kiss their ass, but to... Yeah. There's a there's a term that I, I learned only a few years ago, um, and I it's sort of like, you know, the, my slogan is I'm not here to please you. I'm you know if you're pleased that's fantastic. For sure. But my job is to tell my truth and have my fun and do what I love. And if you like it, great. And if you don't, hopefully the next crowd will. Hmm. And uh, and you know like people go well you know I didn't like Chappelle because he did this and I go well he's not here to please you. Right. Go watch somebody else. Right. <laughs> wow, that's amazing, and that's better than the the constant conversation. I think in comedy now is like, oh, you can't make fun of, can't be funny anymore. You can't make fun of stuff. Oh, you can, right? Exactly, <laughs> and it is just accepting that and having that confidence. It sounds like to just yeah, you know, you. most comedians, and I learned this from Louis when I did Letterman for the first time, and Joan Rivers, <laughs> um, interesting combination, and. Uh, my first set ever on Letterman, I had the help of Zoe Friedman, who was the booker, uh, Bud Friedman and Silver Friedman's daughter. Mm -hmm. And she was the booker there. And also Louis and uh, Joan Rivers and uh, David Brenner, they all told me, when you come out on stage, take a second, look at the crowd and let them know you're in charge. Just one beat. And they, they actually can feel it. So, you know, I would come out there and go, good evening. I wouldn't ask, how are you doing? Because there's no reason to ask a question. I don't really care about the answer. So if you, if you, you know, and we shouldn't care about the answer. Of course right. they're good. They're at a TV taping. They're excited. Or you know, like say you do a comedy show and there's 14 comics on the show. And how 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 is everybody doing? Like yeah. we're just as good as the last 13 comics yeah. that asked us how we're doing. Right. Seven minutes ago, same. Yeah, and we're <laughs> still the same. And uh, but you know, you just go up there and you just have. Take that one beat, smile. I've got this. The audience, you could almost see them sitting back, going, "All right, we're in, we're in good hands here." Wow, that's this, I'm learning so much. Dude, I didn't I expect know, that. Is, I love. <laughs> no, it's, it's it's great hearing from. Oh yeah, people who really know. Even though I'm a Rangers fan. Yeah, no, that yeah. won't hold that against you until <laughs> yeah. until you're gone, and then I'll yeah, talk right, about I you. Understand? Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you, do you consider? Because I know you were born in New York, but uh, do you? So, uh, but you. Didn't spend a I lot of time in, in New York? Brooklyn, right. from Brooklyn. And I lived there till just before my 12th birthday. Moved to Florida with my right. parents, my mother and my stepfather, and a bunch of kids, a shitload of kids, to uh, uh, for junior high school and high school, and then back 
a college in Boston at Emerson, where I mentioned, and right. then back to New York. So, Oh, so do you consider yourself a New Yorker? Yeah. Oh, Nice. See, cool. Except right. for 10 years exactly, I'm a New Yorker. Oh, okay. Oh, I feel you. I was, I, yeah, I was in the Air Force, so eight years I wasn't here. I'm still a New Yorker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. My whole family has accents. <laughs> um, and you've uh, done and I, something I, I definitely just w- want to bring up. You do a lot of charity work. The R- Roberto yeah. Clemente F- Foundation, David's, David Ortiz's uh, Children Fund, uh, Sisters. Well, Clemente was my hero. Oh, is that and, right? Yeah. Cool. And the, my friend Annette, who worked at the Letterman Show, who dealt with the travel and the, a lot of the sports people, she, you know, she was literally <laughs> next door. Her office was next to mine. So. We talked all the time, and she worked for the Yankees before she worked for Letterman. Oh, wow. And she introduced me to, like, Mattingly, and, you know, she knew all of these people really, really well. Such a great person and so loved. And uh, she knew I loved Clemente because, you know, as a Mets fan, as a little kid, the Mets won the World Series on my 11th birthday. Nice. And that's the best birthday present you can imagine, you know, in the world. As a such, I'm such a sports fanatic. And uh, so I – so – an opportunity came to host the Clementi Foundation, and I knew dinners and weekend, and I know that they work with kids, and I've always been, you know, except for the girl that I trashed at uh, Saved by the Bell, I've always been, <laughs> you know, a good example for kids to let them know, <sighs> tell them the truth, and, and let them, you know, develop their own personalities and, and stand behind them and let them know that if they're different, it's not bad, you know, just be who you are, that kind of thing. And I was able to do that with all of these great charities. I, I worked. I worked in Puerto Rico a lot. Got, one of the weirdest things was, you know, Roberto Clemente Jr. and the other brothers are, were all friends. You know, we became friends, which is so surreal. Super cool. But when Roberto Clemente Jr. would call me, on, and my caller ID it would said Roberto Clemente, <laughs> you know, so I was like, oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> nerd guy. So I pick up the phone. I was, oh, it's his son. <laughs> Yeah, and then you know, it, Hola. I met Big Poppy when he was Little Poppy, and he was um, he was in Wisconsin. Uh, he was at the Beloit or Saber Rattlers or something. It was the Minnesota Twins farm right, team, right. and uh, and so his girlfriend was a waitress, and his wife now the waitress at the comedy club. And you know, she knew I was a big sports fan. I said, hey, I want you to meet my boyfriend and. And he's such a great guy. And, you know, he works, he does the same stuff that Clemente's family does. And, right, right. You know, so it's really, a, it's corny, but it's a real joy to see these sports people and kids, like, come alive. Like, I did did a lot of stuff for the, uh, you know, Barry Bond stuff, and everyone has their opinions of Barry Bond, but he's really a great guy right. and mm. really cares about the community. And, oh, and you find that out when you go work. Hey, right. I worked for the Rangers Hockey in Harlem program. For many years, and well, that makes sense. You in Harlem, yeah, it, it, it does. <laughs> and uh, and you know, also I worked for the Flyers and the Bruins, and the one of the closest teams I got to was the Detroit Red Wings back in the Paul Coffey, Steve Eiserman oh, days. Cool, cool. My friend was the announcer for them, and so you know, I'm uh, I love cha- I love love doing charity work. I love getting paid, of course. You know, that's always fun. <laughs> that's nice. But if you can get paid enough and do that charity work, it's very fulfilling. You know. Is he trying to tell imagine. us he wants to get paid for this? Yeah, I think so. I, I, I was. Yeah. Well, <laughs> didn't you get the email in the mail? <laughs> Talk to them at the brokerage tonight. We have all the M and M's. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> Separate it. All right. So, so all right. So you mentioned that you're a big sports nut, and you mentioned Met fan. So I, I have to ask. We had a big conversation on our show yesterday, uh, very topical because it's almost you know forty years later, but. Mookie hits that grounder. Do you think he would have beat he would have beat the pitcher and, and Buckner to first base anyway? I've seen it from seven thousand angles, and I think he would have. Yes, I think he would yes. have. See, that's because exactly what I said. Yes, you know, if it was Stapleton playing first base, it would be a different story. <clears throat> right now, now football wise, what, who's your team? Well, it's all you know. Here, I'm sixty three, so right. uh, you know, and the Mets won the World Series on my birthday in sixty nine. The Jets won the Super Bowl that year. The Knicks won the championship right. uh, with Reed and all that stuff. Right. My father, who was as big a sports fan, was a minor league baseball player. Oh, cool. Oh, wow. He, he um, was nicknamed was Yogi because he was a catcher in Brooklyn at you know Lincoln High School. And uh, 
so there was always sports in, in our life. And well, that's how I got to know Clemente because we were so broke. We had, we can only afford the tickets in right field, you know, <laughs> after so the seventh inning. <laughs> yeah. You know, kids you get in free after the seventh inning. guy out from the corner. <laughs> but, um, uh, the, you know, like what teams you like? He got he took me to see the Knicks Lakers game seven, May 8th, 1970 game. Oh, we man. sat in the third to the top row of Madison Square Garden, but it was one of the most exciting. So that year, 69, 70, uh, really solidified everything for me. And I, I like the Rangers, you know. Yeah, we're, we're exactly opposite, you and I. <laughs> yeah. You like for, for the New York, yeah. But yeah. here's the thing where we might be completely different. When the Mets are not in the World Series, I go to the Yankees World Series. I've been to many of them. I do the same I'm a thing. New Yorker. I, yeah. No, I want the Mets to win. And and this actually is a greater, my theory on this, why we can move from Yankees to Mets or Mets to Yankees. Because the Mets are never in it. But we can't, <laughs> right. we cannot, we cannot go Rangers to Islanders, Islanders to Rangers. Right. Is because they're competing for the same thing, the same right. spot. In the playoffs, yeah. like you Goodbye, can't, right. they're never going to play each other for the championship except for when they, yeah. And, the and, cup, right. and, and this is why I hate interleague play. All right, that's all yeah. I'm going to say. My father, <laughs> my father lived in Oceanside, Long Island. Oh, nice. Cool, cool. So he was a huge Islander fan. So him and I would go, he and I, if my English is correct, though, <laughs> is that he uh, loved the Islanders and I loved the Rangers. So we would go to those games, the famous, you know, games. Uh, I actually even went to see the Islanders. Uh, play Vancouver in 81 and caught a puck off of Butch Goring and it hurt my hand so bad I think it still hurts. <laughs> I All bet. Many, many, never many felt years. right after. <laughs> yeah, it was really bizarre. Wow, that's and, impressive uh, though. That's catching super a cool. puck. Yeah. Holy catching crap. a puck was impressive and stupid. <laughs> it hurt. So I was, you know, young. Wow. But we, my father and I had this rivalry and it was really fun. And then my son, because he grew up you know, he's 34, so he grew up when the Devils were big. And he okay. lived upstate New York. So oh, he's yeah. a wild Devils team fan oh. because they were the best defensive team and won all those Stanley Cups. My yeah. little brothers who grew up in Florida, were born in Florida, were Pirates fans and Steelers fans because in those days in Florida, there was no there baseball. Was, yeah. oh, okay. And the right. Steelers were we are family. and. Right. National you know, broadcast, national game of the week, and whatnot. Yeah. So they, they they go with the best teams. Yeah. And whenever right. the Pirates played the Mets, I would bring them up to New York, and we'd have a great time. You know, having that little rivalry as well. Epic fist fights. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I was bigger, so I won. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <clears throat> Um, all right, so, all right, so we, we kind of yeah, digressing we digress. and into we digress. sports. Yeah, I know. Well, I know you guys do the hockey thing. and uh, <clears throat> Oh, with Chris you know, Roach, I've yeah. I've been told that I would be a guest on that for a couple of years now. But, uh, oh. you know. Well, they just restarted. The pandemic really effed yeah. up a lot yeah, of they, stuff, so and I'm they, sure they will. They actually stopped before the pandemic, yeah. and they it was a good two or three years since – since they were on, they just they they just brought it back uh, about I a month ago. So in your email the other day, it's exciting, you know. I mean, John Trusen and I are great friends anyway because we've known each other for so many years. Wow! But the fact that you know we're Rangers fans and we, you know, I mean, it's it's amazing how sports brings people together. You Absolutely, know? Uh, yeah. But Trusen, he he scares me. He's really into that. Like he'll like you'll make a break a friendship with that man over hockey. Yeah, that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's not healthy. <clears throat> you know, and that's actually a good example. Uh, that that's a good segue into my well, one of the questions I had regarding Letterman because you you became the guy that was you know kind of bringing in the comedians to be on the show. And yeah. talk about a guy like Trusen. I mean, years before I got involved in this in this club, I knew who Trusen was on a local level. To me, one of the guys where I'm, I always felt you know should have been a household name. And there's a million comedians we can, you know, put in that category. Were there, were there ever comedians that you threw onto Letterman that you thought this is the one that's gonna, you know, get on the map and and never and just never kind of took off Not like that? Really, because I was booking comics that I knew Letterman would like. You know, he has everyone. It's a, such a subjective, uh, you know, idea. You know, to who's the funniest comedian. And it's not the Eddie Brill show. You know, it was the Eddie Brill show. There's a few comedians I would have put on that they didn't let me put on right. because uh, according to the producers and, uh, you know, not Dave, you know, one on one. But they would say, no, this we've looked at the tapes and no, we don't want this comedian. And, uh, you know, 
I mean, it's again, it's the Dave Letterman show and it's what he likes. So I would book people that I was pretty sure he would like. And uh, and out of the 4000 or so comedians from around the world that wanted to be on the show, I could put on like 12 to 20 and probably six to eight of them were regulars every year. So now I only had room for maybe three or four new ones. And then, you know, people hated me or actually people probably still hate me. You know, there are people who are uncomfortable around me because I didn't put them on TV. I bet. Yeah. Yeah. I used to run a comedy club in 84 called the paper moon. We, yep. Colin Quinn and I kind of started it and cool. it was wildly successful and it became the Boston comedy club. I gave it up because I wanted to travel the world as a comic. And, um, and in those days, people were, you know, begging and we were able to have 52 comics because we had a comic a headliner every weekend. Right. And uh, and then all the locals. And I try to give everyone stage time. And I was trying to be a mentor. And I put a lot of young comedians on. But you don't put on a comic who's not ready on a big television show. Right. Uh, it's been done, but it's not the right thing to do. So, you know, I, along the way, I disappointed people in like. I, I wanted to be the booker that I wanted as a comedian. Right. So, like, if I had an audition, I didn't want to go home not knowing if I got the show or not. So after the auditions, I'd stay around. And any comic who came wanted, I'd give them notes. Oh, not wow. Saying, that's great. That would be so awesome. Great. Because that's what I wanted. Right. But not everyone I made. The mistake I made was thinking everyone wanted that. And what people wanted was, you got the show. And if they didn't get the show, it's like, fuck you. Right. You know, <laughs> you you. And who do you think you are not knowing how great I am? And it, there are amazing comedians that I love that I could, I wasn't allowed to put on the show. <clears throat> wow. There are a couple of comedians that I was, you know, begging. And they were like, no, this doesn't fit the show. And, you know, that kind of thing. And people right. think I'm sitting in my apartment going, Because <laughs> 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 I know that was, yeah, with, with Carson. Yeah, you know, see, these are things I, I, I've never thought about. I, I remember with Carson... The, the comedian would come out, and if he liked you, he would call you over to sit down. And that right. was always the big the, thing. Uh, right. Oh, yes. The, yes. Yeah. So I always just assumed that it was just, like, I always assumed, like, Johnny didn't know who this guy was that was, or this girl was that was coming on. And Dave didn't always know who it was. <clears> but you but you still learned the whole... certain cri criteria, I guess. Yeah, and there were yeah. all other producers on the show, and, you right, know, right. and, uh, Geek you know, and they worked even closer <laughs> Booking wise, that you know, it's a booker from for the whole show um, that that was out there, and you know, they would call me last minute, and I'd have somebody ready to go, and I mean, it's a really incredible job. It was a tough yeah, job, sure. But I, I, I was fighting for comedians the whole way, and a lot of comedians don't know that they don't know what went on behind the scenes where I fought for certain comedians or fought for more comedians on the show and all that kind of stuff, and uh, I. Yeah, I did my best, and it didn't always work, you know. But again, I wanted to be the person I wanted as book. I watched every tape that any comedian sent me. I watched them. I didn't have assistance to watch them. Right. I watched thousands of wow. sets. I, if I traveled to a club, say Denver, on Sunday, I'd ask them to put on ten of their best local comics. Instead of them sending me tapes, I can see them live and right. take notes. And so I'm proud of what I did. I'm proud of who I helping a lot of people out. And, you know, if I look back, the, I sort of regret a little of it because it, I didn't focus on my own comedy. Even though I worked, I had to be careful not to do other people's material. Right. But I heard thousands of stuff. Sure. And I had to prepare comedians all the time. I had the comedian on this week and I was doing the whole production of the segment. And then while I had three or four other comedians getting ready to go and three or four other comedians that I was giving it, you know, sort of mentoring and letting them know, look, I think you're great. Stick with it and, you know, work on some sets. And, you know, so it was a pretty full time job, but it was kind of cool to be able to do that kind of a job. <clears> and <throat> for that show in that theater for that man. Right. Right. Uh, and Right, that, and that's the thing you mentioned. You didn't get to do your own comedy or focus on it as much, but at the same time, you made you made your mark in the comedy world yeah. for being that guy in that building for that man. That yeah. I, I mean, I, you know, I think that's a pretty impressive yeah. uh, title to have. Yeah, and you have to remember not to be to try to be impressive. And I know what you're saying. I'm not putting it down, but you have to really just do the job that you you're assigned to do. Be present. And do it well, and take you know. Everyone at that show, like Dave Dorsett had the main camera. 
Dave Dorsett was the cameraman for Letterman. Dave Dorsett was the cameraman for Walter Cronkite. Oh, wow. You know what wow. I mean? So everyone at the show, the producers, the writers, the lighting people, the band, the every, they were the best at what they did. And you had to play on that level. And right. that's the most fun about that job. You were, And then when the show was over and all that work you put on, forget about it because you got a show tomorrow. Right. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> you know, speaking of cameraman, do you know Dan Flaherty? You know that name? Yes. Yeah, Dan's a friend of mine. Oh, good. Oh, sweet, nice guy. Yeah, yes. Very, I mean, that's yeah. my whole story. I don't have a story. Yeah. I'm just throwing names yeah. out. Yeah, I have more story than, than you. <laughs> well, and that's, what's that? No, no, I'm kidding. Oh. He's my cousin. <laughs> you know, what What was it? I mean, you're talking about going to other countries. How does, how does that work? I mean, what if you're like Bangladesh? I mean, it was... Was the audience, were they English speaking? Was or it a boat, well, boat you know, maker uh, convention? <laughs> right. Like most countries in the world, there's a 1%. Yes. And they're the people who travel the world and, yeah. you know, have the money. And Bangladesh, it's a very poor country, very much uh, like America. You know, it's like the, the most of the people are in poverty and having a hard time. And uh, we we don't think of it like that. But Bangladesh is really that to the 400th power yeah but the one percent tyler uh bangladeshis who are brilliantly smart people who are savvy in business who know the english language and uh they were really great audiences and there was a guy i, I had worked with in la who was from there and asked me to come over and do stand-up and it was i was i didn't know what to expect and these audiences were, were smart i didn't have to you know explain over explain things they were they knew the news they knew the news better than we did wow. they knew, you know because they're they're interested their businesses rely on america to be a strong uh, powerful economy right huh yeah so, again you know, that's so, yeah so and what i was i was going to ask too i guess you didn't have to change your material to make it relatable to for them yeah you know what happens <laughs> is is you write for humans as opposed to writing for people country yeah, okay. you know, like a okay. like like you, like if I had a, a set of jokes about, you know, dreams, you fall asleep and you have these dreams, everyone in the world has dreams. So you do material about dreams and it cuts across every, you know, border there is. Um, and, you know, so you learn to do that. And then when you want to explain, like you can, you learn how to explain stuff that they might not know. Or you can sense that they're not knowing something. But I had so many years of experience of working overseas. Um, it, it made me a better comic because it forced me to really work hard and to really focus and to pay attention and to use a lot of nonverbal communication. Because like, like you think of Jack Benny, he got his biggest laughs on pauses. Yeah, you right. Know? And yeah. a lot of American comics or any comics that are starting out will say the word right in every pause, right? <laughs> You know, yeah. and that what that's saying is I'm not secure in this material. I'm a little bit nervous on stage. I need to fill in that silence because I'm not comfortable in it. You know, right? Yep. You know, uh, yep. I right. What ends up I do happening? That. I do. Yeah, I, yeah, the I negative said, space. you know a thousand times on stage. And if you watch the great comics, they they don't say right, 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 right. And what you're saying is when you're asking them right, you're saying, look, I don't really have confidence in what I do. I need your approval. And remember, I, back in the beginning, we were talking about, I'm not here to please you. Right. It's like, I wrote a joke about Adam and Eve. And I'm not going to do the whole joke, but I read, why do Adam and Eve have names? And that was the premise of the joke. Uh, and the whole point of it is they're the only people on earth and who's naming them, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I said, why do Adam and Eve have names? And I changed it to, I've often wondered why Adam and Eve have names. And it changed the whole uh, joke because now I'm coming from a position of knowing, right. position of telling you how I came up with this and not asking you to answer a question for me. Right. Oh, okay. It's almost like in sales, help. like a close ended thing. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Jeez, I yeah. feel like I'm in a class today. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> hey, I got no class over here. <laughs> This is uh, this is fantastic. I uh, I can't thank you enough for uh, spending some time with us today. Um, out yeah, absolutely. Nice. Thank you very much. Uh, so tonight and tomorrow at the brokerage in Belmore, uh, yeah, Eddie Brill tonight, and my friend J.R. Havlin, who wrote for the Daily Show for eighteen years and was on Letterman. He's with me tonight. Oh wow. And Joe Pontillo, who I've worked with a lot, a lot, a lot. Oh, Joe's fantastic. 
Yeah, him and I have, have uh, had a lot of fun over the years, and we've worked a lot of the Long Island clubs together. Right. And he, uh, last minute, Jr. couldn't do the Saturday, so I got Joe to come in and. Uh, oh, that's great! It's eight, cool. eight o'clock tonight, seven thirty tomorrow night. November twenty third, Joe's going to be in here. Um, All right. Yeah, Joe's great. So. Uh, He's great. And and so um, EddieBrill dot com is that or Eddie Eddie Brill yeah, comic Eddie dot com yeah. I'm on you know Eddie underscore Brill at Twitter, but um, Eddie Comic is who I am at uh, Instagram, and that right. I get a lot of stuff at Instagram, and you know I have all these uh, kind of stuff uh, these things. I, yeah. I love your explaining phrases, the history of yeah phrases. That's... Well, I always loved that <laughs> when I was little. I get, there was a joke book that my mom got me because I loved comedy she loved comedy we had comedy albums in our house my parents were only 20 when i was born so we were like having older brother and sister with cool comedy albums right right and we always made fun of words and uh she gave me this joke book and I'm, i'll never forget the joke it was what did tennessee and the answer is the same thing arkansas <laughs> right. and you know, here i am i'm five years old going ah this is the greatest. and my parents loved it and they we were all laughed so i always loved words so i would I would constantly play with words. I would take index cards and I'd put like a guy running and next to him a cross, like a running across. And it's not brilliant or anything, but my six-year-old mind was like right. playing with words. And then I saw Carlin on The Tonight Show and I was like, oh, yeah, you know, that's that's my hero. And so I've always been, I have a lot of fun with words. I've and, always and felt that way with the road signs that say stop ahead. Yeah, like why would anybody <laughs> want to stop head? There was one yeah. in there was you one. Know, keep going. <laughs> when, there was a, a. I was stationed in North Dakota. We were driving from Devil's Lake back to Minot, and right before you got to the town of Minot, there was a big sign that said "Bump Ahead," and there was a guy that if you drove with him, he would hit you in the fucking head uh, as <laughs> he was driving. He'd be like, "Whap," and you'd be like, "What the hell?" And <laughs> that's his one joke. You know? Right? Exactly. 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 To telling that joke. It's like you guys want to go to Devil's Lake? No. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. If this guy asks you to go to Devil's no, Lake, like, don't. no, <laughs> please don't do that. No. All right, there thank you go, you. Eddie Brill. Again, thank you so thank much. You. This was an absolute pleasure Super talking cool. with you today. Absolutely, it's my pleasure. Absolutely, you can always send me a link, and I'll run it and have it run again. Or huh? you know whatever. Yeah, I'll um, yeah, yeah, I'll isolate it, I'll edit it and stuff, and yeah, send it over to you. That'd be great. Thank you very much. And right, uh, have hopefully a, see each other in person soon. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, and uh, again, this weekend at the brokerage. Thank you, Eddie, so much. Thank you. See ya. All take right, care. take care now. Let's see. Give me a, Awkward button press. Yeah, button press figure button out button how to yeah, I'm getting leave, leave meeting. <laughs> <laughs> bump, bump ahead. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. Oh, my God. That was one of the coolest. 